I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Welcome to the Q&A, everyone. David, what do we up, have up today? All right, this first one is from Vince Marshall, 9520, and he asks, I read an account where there were sticks placed on a stump in a specific manner. When a photo was shown to a linguist, it was identified as the Chinese symbol for big man. Is it conceivable that these creatures crossed the Bering Strait land bridge from Asia and are actually familiar with Asian languages? Well, the first part, sure, it's possible. But here's the thing. Um, I, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll use my own experience here. I, I took a Chinese history course my first year of college. And, and the man who taught it was born and raised in China. And one of the things he talked about was their language. Um, and, and understanding Chinese history and, and their language, um, they didn't have a unified language until, oh geez, I think it was probably the, probably the 1950s. And I could be wrong exactly that, but he talked about that. It was after the communists came into control, they sort of standardized things, you know, throughout China so they could, um, now of course you, you folks could talk to each other, but as far as written language, it, it wasn't really a standardized thing. It was, there were different things in different parts of the country. So the communists there kind of, uh, enabled that to happen. So going back to say something, you know, a creature that may have learned symbols, um, would have been, you know, difficult at best, you know, I mean, they would have had to pass that down from generation to generation. And we don't know if it was an actual, you know, part of a language or not. Um, my thinking, if somebody would put something on a stump, um, that was somebody who knew Chinese characters and, and they did it on purpose. It wasn't one of the creatures. That's my take on it. Yeah, I don't see how they would be able to even get access to see symbols like that and remember them and pass them down. Yeah, they he talked about how, you know, a lot of the folks in China weren't even um, literate in terms of being able to write, you know, let alone the language differences. So, uh, you know, having that having that as far as a, um, you know, common kind of a thing would have been difficult at best. And then. And then if the creature did it, why would it say, why would it say something like that? You know, it well, knows it's when, a big hairy creature. <laughs> even when a lot of them had the same languages, they had different dialects, which made it hard to understand each other. So and that's true. Got that problem. Yeah, there's, there's some issues there. I mean, it's just, I, I would suggest anybody, you know, is interested in that take a look at Chinese history and it's very interesting, especially the linguistics part. Um, but, you know, going back to this, yes, they could have crossed the land bridge and may may very well have. But in terms of something like that, I, that to me, that just sounds like it's something that somebody did yeah. on purpose. Well, okay. I, do we do, do we want to completely dis, discount uh, the stick symbols? Because I think when we look at things like the, the, the X's that we find in the in, in the forests or territorial markers, tree breaks, um, I don't think myself personally, I, I don't think we can completely discount that, that they, they may be markers for, for who knows. For oh yeah. The, the broken tree, broken and twisted trees certainly are markings. In fact, you know, native friends of mine have told me exactly what those mean. You know, the, hmm. um, oh, I'm trying to think, well, my friend, friends from Klamath Falls, Klamath Indians, told me that, you know, those were territorial markings. And then there was another marking that showed the rest of the group which way they were going to the next feeding area and things like that. Uh, and even warnings where there was a high area of human activity had markings for that. They were very similar. And it's interesting. These things are, are stuff that, you know, from from humans, we would go out in the woods and not even recognize it because to us it's just broken brush. It doesn't mean anything. Right. 
yeah, it, 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 but it certainly is a sign of, 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 of an advanced, uh, of, a, of a society, you know, uh, a somewhat advanced society where they, where they've developed language. Uh, and which is obvious because we, we certainly have documented and we've heard a lot of examples of, of language. So the next logical step in that is, uh, very basic symbols, uh, as a means of communication. So, I mean, stick symbols on the ground, I, I don't, I, I, it might be a stretch to say that, you know, it's a Chinese symbol meaning hairy man, but it certainly, it certainly could be evidence of something. Um, either another human being there and placing it there, depending on where the location is, but we don't know that. Or it certainly could be, it could be something meaningful that was created by a sentient being in the forest that has the ability to communicate with others of its own kind at a high level. Okay, David, what do we have next? That goes good into this next one from Linda Taylor, 8302. Do they build structures? You know, there's there's people all over Facebook that put pictures of this stuff up. I can tell you from all around the West Coast, I've never seen one. Um, and then you have to ask yourself, why would they do that? I mean, the Sasquatch is a very pragmatic creature. It doesn't do anything that's outside of its um, necessity for keeping itself alive. Uh, I guess we could ask Don. Don, what do you think about that from a native perspective? Ooh. Well, yeah, he, he definitely does push trees and branches, and especially for, uh, he can bend trees down at an angle where he, he can make a little shape for himself and sit and watch you, whether you're tending your flock, your horses, livestock, or, you know, he'll be watching you from basically anywhere and wherever where you go where he was at, you know, if you see, see him like up on the hill underneath the tree, you go up there and you definitely can see where he sat and you're standing underneath that tree where he was just sitting down like he was just sitting down and you're up there where he was at, you're standing up in that tree still right over you, you know. And um yeah, as far as the uh trees and all that, the tree breaks, you know, I have not really seen much of any of that but the one that is kind of out of place was uh, on one of his, his trails I normally took to go follow him. He uh, pulled up a little pine tree. Uh, it was probably seven feet tall. Mm-hmm. And that pine tree, he took it up straight up from the root and everything, and then he put that tree back down, upside down, on his uh, trail, on his trail path. Mm-hmm. And uh, on that path, there's all kinds of shapes and sizes of tracks, you know, the biggest one I've seen was 21, the average is 17 inches, the biggest one I've seen actually is 27 inches, and I don't know what to make of that one, but that one's a gigantic one, and, and as far as cultural point of view, for us um, Navajo, um, we, we are told not to uh, disturb nature, disturb Mother Earth, you know, instead of uh, moving rocks and boulders and trees. We were told to add to the beauty and make it more beautiful than it was. So mm-hmm. that, that was our code is the way of nature. The law of nature is always going to prevail against us. You know, the law of nature is time is with its side. So, you know, it could be something similar to that where, but as far as uh, our knowledge on him, on uh, our area, our land, he does live underground. So underneath us, um, there's tunnels. You know, they, they say once he takes you underneath there, they're never going to find you. And you're toast. And, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'll find clothes, uh, shoes, and then tunnels, and you're going to run to some, something else underneath some tunnels. Um, there's actually uh, some stories where um, some locals went cave diving, and they uh, came up on a UFO parking site. <laughs> and another one where... Uh, where a creature has its knee backwards and light, you know, like white pale skin. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of things in the cage. That I would, I would wait till a team go with me down there. <laughs> but um, as far as that, he, he does live underground. He does take the canyons, the tunnels, um, the high areas. He does not stay in one place at all. So he, he doesn't really need a, need a structure, maybe for the little ones, but mm-hmm. as far as I know, 
The only structures I've ever seen that I know they do is the rock stacks, rocks mm-hmm. that a person couldn't lift, but they could. Right, but I think one other, yeah, I think one other structure most people think of when they hear the word is the giant teepees with the all the trees leaned against each other. I've never seen one of those that a human couldn't have done, and I've never seen tracks of a Sasquatch around those structures. And and that's the thing, like with all the pictures people put on Facebook, I'm waiting to see the footprints around the structures. I have yet to see anything like that. Right. Uh, we did find one, well, I guess you could call it a structure, um, when we filmed in Oregon two years ago. And it wasn't so much of a structure. Well, it kind of was. It was a kill zone. And you could see where all of these trees were snapped over and arranged so that it was on a game trail so that any deer coming down the trail uh, would be momentarily stopped. And the creatures were probably adjacent to it, you know, ready to pounce when something came along. But right. it was clear it was clearly a created structure. And this was yeah. way out in the middle of nowhere. And it was something that was done without without any kind of tools. Yeah. Okay, what do we have up next? All right, this next one is from Trolls Tabernacle 8980. And their question is, some people think the Sasquatch is supernatural and can sense cameras and stuff and won't appear unless you habituate it, etc. But in other accounts, it acts like a belligerent ape. How come it's like that? Is it a supernatural thing with superpowers or just a very large, clever ape? Should we go around the table on that one, fellas? <laughs> I'd like to start off on that. Okay. Go ahead, Tracy. Okay. First of all, they're an animal. Okay. Now, we know that cats have a particular vision range. They're very sensitive to certain ranges of light. Who's to say they can't see infrared? Okay which all these game cameras that are out there, that's what they use, an infrared sensor. Okay, so it's probably like a beacon saying, hey, stay the hell away from here. Mm -hmm. Don't go over there near that to them. That's one thing I honestly believe because they're nocturnal mostly. We know that or suspect that. Am I correct, Will? <laughs> yeah, and, and the yeah. other part of that is is there's a primate, and primates in the wild have been seen and studied often uh, with man-made objects in their environment. They will go to great lengths to avoid man-made objects and, and anything else that don't belong in their environment, but especially man-made objects. I didn't know this until I was researching something else totally different. Um I have a niece with a with a vision problem, and I was looking things up. And some human beings actually have the ability to detect infrared light. Oh, that's interesting. I've heard that. And very rare. the condition she has, she, I, I, I have an, an infrared light. And I turned it on, and she said, turn it off. It hurts my eyes. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, why is it so far-fetched for somebody to believe that they can't just see the the light beam coming off of that thing? I believe they can. I mean, it's, it's a spectrum of light. Um, humans, some humans are... You know, can't perceive it. How do we know cats, um, you know, other animals, primates especially, how do we know they can't perceive it too? I mean, I don't, they don't build tools. They don't make tools. I mean, I've never heard um, a report of a sighting of them using a tool or using even a stick as a weapon other than as, you know, like to throw it or a rock to throw it. You know, technically, like throwing of rocks that we hear often, 
the rock stacks and piles and breaking and twisting of trees. That's actually, those are all actually forms of tool use. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But, but they don't make our heads, which we, we do know that, that Neanderthal was able to do. Right. You know, they, they made our heads or points to stab things with. I, I think know. it depends on, you know, whether a species needs to do that or not. Right. I, yeah. I think they lack the ability to fabricate tools, but right. but tools right. at a very basic level, uh, like clubs, mm-hmm. you know, stones or whatever for their purposes. Sure. You know. Well, and I, I saw chimps using sticks to stick into an ant hill to get the ants out to eat them. You know, oh, that's, sure. that's tool usage, you know. Yeah, absolutely. But okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. Oh. Um, uh, go ahead, Jim. Sorry, Tracy. No, that's okay. I mean, I was just going to say I, I kind of have some opinions on that, and we can get into that later. So, sure. All right. All right, David. All right. This next one is from Poppy Girl, and she says, "Is Rebecca? She did a four-part series. Still having encounters?" No, actually, I messaged her recently, and she moved to a different area, and uh, where there's no possibility of activity. She couldn't take it anymore, huh? <laughs> <laughs> she got out of Dodge. <laughs> All right. You ready for the next one? We're ready. All right. This one is from Vince Marshall, 9520. Will, what do you mean when you say that you don't share all that you know? Is the average person not able to comprehend it or what? Thank you. Well, I'll be honest. I only share maybe between 10 and 20 percent of what I know. It's not that people can't handle it is they would use it to go out and get themselves in a real bad situation. That's really what it boils down to. And I, I don't want to see anybody hurt. You know, I'm not going to put stuff out that's going to put people in a bad situation. And I'm telling you, out in the field, this stuff can go bad really, really quick, way faster than you can adapt to. Oh, yeah. Hey, Will, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Have you have you heard from Mr. Black lately? And yeah, we is there anything you, you Is there anything new you could share with us? Um, well, he's just been busy with his own projects lately, but, uh, we were still planning on recording, uh, for his channel because we, I created a channel that's all, that's going to be just him and our plans are still to record. Uh, he wants to record about three months worth of shows and, um, wow. so he can, he can make sure that everything's okay and, you know, he's he's retaining creative control over that. What he puts out, his NDA is finally expired, so he's able to talk about this stuff without my having to change his voice or do anything like that. So I, I'm real happy about that because it was really a pain on the backside to try to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have several recordings that we did, and it's just a nightmare to do that stuff. Oh, nice. So is uh. But he'll be free to be talking about anything, right? He's going to talk about everything that he knows. Oh, nice. Even the, uh, I wonder if he was at a Pete Diddy party. Do you think so? No, I'm just I, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> he, he's not the kind that would be involved in that sort of thing. <laughs> okay, David, what do we get up next? All right, this one is from Geraldine Fields, 1730. And she said, I heard on another channel that wood knocking is the Sasquatch's way of warning each other that humans are approaching. Do you think that's true? How does, how do people know that? Exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's all kinds of ideas. And I'll tell you, I, I saw a show last night and I can't remember the name of it offhand, but, uh, it was, they were, uh, they were combining these people who committed acts like one guy blew up a, a motor home in this town in, uh, I want to say South Carolina. And he supposedly, they, they were trying to, it was, they were trying to link paranormal, people involved in paranormal subjects with criminal acts that they did. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not quite sure they actually bridged 
because the guy didn't actually say he was he was blowing up the motorhome in this town because it, of, of lizard people, but they, they were making all these weird connections. So there's all kind. I mean, what they were doing is highlighting all these crazy ideas that a lot of people have out there. Yeah. And uh, and I think, you know, we we see that with our stuff too. It's everywhere. You can't get away from it. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think I got a little off track there, but. Um, I did get one knock uh, this past summer out in the Kaibato area on the reservation. One loud, clear knock. And um, as far as the Navajo Rangers, you know, I've I seen a, one of the episodes there, uh, one of the Navajo Rangers saying that um, when you hear a wood knock, this is what they came up with. Um, they said when, they, when you hear a wood knock, that's the sound of the Sasquatch entering or exiting the portal. That's one of the that's one of the things they came up with, but I'm not mm-hmm. sure if they I'm not sure if they've seen that. <laughs> well, I th- yeah. I think we'd have to really go out and observe it, and, and I'm not totally convinced that it's actually wood knocks. I, I think a lot of times it's tongue pops, you know, oh, especially yeah, when they hear yeah. these they hear these noises in places where there aren't any trees or anything like that. So they hear a noise that sounds like that, and and I've heard we've actually got a recording of one. That was so loud, you know, like when a when a baseball bat makes a loud crack, it's almost like a gunshot. And this recording is like that. Wow. So I, I think yeah. we're you know the that's still an open topic. Yeah. Okay, what do we have next? All right, this next one is from a marathon picker, and they said, "I wonder if locomotive engineers have seen them." I bet they have, and I bet they have company-wide directives to not talk about them. What do you think? Well, I have interviewed people where people who worked on trains did see them. Um, Mr. Black actually told me that on occasion they would jump on trains and ride them. I've heard that. So it would be interesting, you know, to talk to another witness. It's been a long time since I talked to the witness um, who worked a stretch of Central Oregon train many years ago and talked about seeing the creatures from the train. But, you know, where trains are, um, are pretty remote areas often, so I'm sure they probably do more than we think. Now, whether or not they got procedures about reporting and all that is unknown, but, uh, and that's even, even, well, that even goes, why would you know, they do that? What's that? Uh, jump on a train. I mean, you think maybe just a thrill or? Just to travel no, fast. Uh, no idea. No idea. I mean, maybe just a, they don't uh, get tired of walking. Jump on the yeah. train and go uh, for a show, show bravado to, you know, the other animals you know, around, you know. Hey, look what I'm doing. Now, that's an interesting point because that something like that, and, and I'll, I'll preface this with something I saw when I was first taking anthropology courses years ago. Um, they showed us a film about this group of chimps. And in the chimps, of course, the males all had their hierarchy. And you got to be fairly high up on the, the list there to be able to mate. So what they did was they introduced things foreign to this group of chimps. Like one of these things was a, uh, it was a five gallon metal can. So when one of the chimp, one of the lower chimps took this thing and started rolling it, making all this noise and, and it was shiny and, and it scared the hell out of the, the upper ranked males. So all of a sudden this lower ranked male moved way up high on the list. So you, you get my point. If they, yeah. if the Sasquatch were doing things that were like that, you know, lacks of bravado, you know, maybe that would increase their chances of mating. I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I don't know. Nobody does what Sasquatch society is like and, and how they're, uh, how they choose mates, but it's a common thing in primates where they have to do something to kind of stand out of the crowd. I mean, good Lord, look what humans do. You know, all the, yeah, all the exactly. and crazy. Yeah, I mean, humans are, we're yeah. notorious for doing things like that, trying to intru- increase our chances. So, uh, Especially, you know, young, young, young men, teenagers yeah. are notorious for it. But Do crazy but things. Exactly. That, <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting that you mentioned that because all of the reports of Sasquatch just stepping casually out in front of traffic and walking across the road when yeah. they could have waited 
a few seconds and crossed without anybody seeing them and causing a big ruckus or anything like that. Right. Uh, and there may, you know, there, there could be some truth there when it comes down to them them doing a, a certain display, right? You know, and here's another one. When we were in Oregon two years ago, one of the things, and I talked about this before, and it's in our film, uh, and unfortunately the film, the audio, didn't really portray just how dramatic what it was we were hearing with all these logs being thrown around uh, because it was loud from where we were standing. And uh, it was 2 a.m., 2.30 in the morning, and we just decided to stop for a bit to see if we could hear or see anything before going in for the night. And all the all this ruckus started up, and it was probably about 60 yards out in front of us. And I don't think the creatures knew we were there because we went past, and the road didn't even go close to that location. But the nearest point, you know, they, they may have seen or heard the vehicle go past, and, and we went out towards the highway, and then we sort of came back on a spur road. And... All this ruckus happened. And my thinking was that, well, it wasn't directed toward us. Uh, and, and there was no roads or trails or anything out in that location. So I, I was wondering why they would be doing something like that in the middle of the night, you know, making that big a ruckus. And then I thought, well, I wonder if maybe they were, you know, these youngsters were doing something kind of this, this, this display, uh, to sort of show off for the girls, so to speak. Yeah possible it's the only thing i could think of i couldn't figure out any other reason why they'd be doing something it was out in the middle of the forest there was no water bodies nearby no anything yeah hmm. okay we get celebrating festivus feats of yeah they were there was something weird going on there it was just it was i mean over the years i've, I've seen and heard you know and, and oftentimes they're one of a kind events but just the strangest Things have happened, and it just kind of you makes you scratch your head and wonder what in the world were they doing? What were they doing that for? All right. Okay, we got time for one more, I think. All right, this last one is a very simple one. We'll close with that, and it is from Dane Fenton, forty eighty two, and our question is: Where can we see pictures? Pictures Internet. of Sasquatches. Yeah. <laughs> well, I say thing basically. I'd say beware of what you see on the internet. Yeah. If you want you know, to good stuff, go to the JRG Facebook page. Yeah, people, you know, people are, I, we've got a really good group there, over 4,000 members on the page, and everybody is very, I, I, I encourage people to be skeptical about things, and, and people are good there. They all go through and, and really uh, comb through what gets posted. So I would definitely go there. Yeah. Well, everyone, any any final thoughts or anything before we wrap this session up? Good questions. Keep them coming. I, I would really like to see you do the show, Will, about um, the one we talked about a few months ago, um, the ideas of the origin and, and what they are, you know, and oh, sure, what we think of them. Yeah, I, I'm, work, I, I'm working on a project with that. I'd, I'd really like to uh, participate in that, if you don't mind. <laughs> oh, sure. Absolutely. Keith, anything, last thoughts or anything? Uh, no, uh, things things have been quiet here. I'm going to be going out into an area in the next, well, this, this coming up weekend, that oh. uh, I've had some experience and encounters in uh, going back probably about nine nine. 10, 12 years, somewhere in that area. Haven't been out there for a while because it's been um, used. The gravel pit has been since used uh, about three, four years ago to upgrade the highway that goes by it. And so I didn't expect to see much in there, but I'm going to spend some time in there and, and see mm-hmm. and see what's going on. And so if there's anything interesting that's, that's happening, I'll certainly be back to report. Yeah, tell us next week how, uh, what you find. Please do, and be careful. Don, yeah, any I'm final not going alone, that's for oh, sure. Sorry. And, and yeah, I, don't go alone. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll be out before, well, I'll be, I'll be in my vehicle before nightfall, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> oh, good, good. Yeah, good plan. Don, how about yeah. you? Any final thoughts? Oh, man. It's, uh, I had a lot of fun. Thank you for uh, inviting me on, guys. I had a, lot of, I had a great time with you all. You're always welcome. 
and you'll see you'll see everybody you'll see Don prominently in our I don't know, I don't know if Adam's inclu- I don't think if he I don't know if he's including anything in this upcoming trip in the second film or not, but definitely the third. Because that'll be mostly what we're doing up there. He'll be filming for that, so all right everyone. Well listen, thanks for stopping by. Keep the questions coming. Um I don't know, David, if you want to give out your email for questions. Well, I'm just going to ask people to leave it in the comment section for now. i got to work on that email. Something's gone wrong with it. So if you leave it in the comments, I'll be sure to see it, and we'll get to it on the show. Yeah, put them in the comments on the YouTube channel, folks. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for stopping by, and come and see us again next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.